Bernard Salt, I'm a partner with KPMG based in Melbourne. Uh, my presentation today deals with high altitude demographics. I'm a big fan of big picture high altitude demographics. Where were we? Where are we? Where are we heading? And, uh, and I think no better way to, um, to look at health and wellness and well-being than to actually take a big picture historical look at, uh, at how Australians and Australian lifestyles have changed. If you go back 80 years to look at life expectancy in Australia in 1935, the average Australian lived for 63 years. Uh, you qualified for the age pension at 65, so you promptly dropped dead uh, two years before you got a pension back in uh, 1935. The other thing to note is that in 1935, you were a child for 15 years or 14 years, and then you're an adult. The life form that we now know as the teenager did not exist in 1935. Childhood, adulthood, old age and death. That's the way it worked 80 years ago. Uh, and if you are unhappy in your relationship, as a 50 year old in 1934, you'd think, well, what's the point? I'm going to be dead in 10 years' time. Might as well just wait it out. Whereas baby boomers say, I've got another 30 years of life. I want to use that time. I want usable life, quality of life beyond 50. Baby boomers think differently uh, going forward. 40 years later, 1975, life expectancy is now 71. That is six years in retirement that now has to be funded either by the individual or by the state. The other thing that's happened by 1935 is that the teenager has made their appearance, 13 to 19, and you're now not an old person until well into your 60s. Let's kick it forward another 40 years to 2015. And life expectancy for the average Australian has kicked out to 82 years. That is 17 years in retirement. Although the most common age at retirement for an Australian is not 65, it's 58. That is 24 years in retirement. What are you going to do? Sit at home and babysit the grandkids for 24 years? Baby boomers will not do that. They will reinvent that space. And I think baby boomers will work on beyond 58, beyond 60, maybe even beyond 65. And they'll put a positive spin around this. This isn't baby boomers working longer. Uh, they are engaged in a portfolio lifestyle. And the reason why they would do that is because it has suddenly occurred to baby boomers that they haven't saved enough to live in retirement in the manner to which they've become accustomed. And so they're extending the working life. 85% of jobs are in services. Now, I get it. If you're a boilermaker or a labourer or a farmer or a tradie, perhaps you might not be able to work beyond 55, beyond 60, but a vast proportion of the population can and will. And anything that can be done to prolong that improves the quality of life, reduces exposure to the public sector, if you like, the public purse, uh, and, uh, and in fact it's, it's a simply mo better model going forward. The other thing to note is that by 2015, Gen X and Gen Y have picked up the teenage phase in the life cycle, they've picked it up and they've stretched it. I think you're now a teenager between the ages of 13 and 29. All of the measures of the transition into adulthood that baby boomers making at 21, 22, 23, commitment to marriage, mortgage, children and a career has been kicked out. There has been a redefinition of how you live your life in your 20s, cafes, bars, restaurants, gap years. Who had heard of a gap year 10 years ago? It's a, it's a, it's a new narrative of how life is lived in your 20s. And in fact, I think what we will see is a new narrative of how life is lived by baby boomers, 58 to 72, over the next decade. Wellness, well-being, volunteering, portfolio lifestyles. Um, the previous generation invented the concept of the grey nomad. Um, I think that the baby boomers are putting a new spin on this. They, they're not doing the caravan trip around this Australia, they're doing the Rhine River cruise. And you can actually see those advertisements on a Saturday uh, in the newspapers, just coming out of nowhere. Like a rifle shot hits the right demographic at the right time. Wellness, well-being, portfolio lifestyles, volunteering. These are the themes, yoga, Pilates. Uh, anything that uh, contributes to preventative medicine, wellness, well-being would be businesses to be in. Uh, and you can actually see that emerging uh, throughout Australia. This is the big picture picture of how we have changed over the last 80 years or so. Uh, but, of course, the issue is uh, longevity, how long we are living, not just the average age of life, but how long we're living into retirement. 
If you're a baby boomer born in 1955, you would be 60 years old today. When you were born, uh, your life expectancy was in fact um, 69 years. You would be dead by the end of this decade. But in actual fact, what has happened is that over the last 60 years, life expectancy for that fifth person born in 1955 has pushed out, uh, in fact, to, um, uh, to 85. And the argument is that over the next 25 years, as baby boomers go from 60 to 85, there'll be further gains in health so that the average 60-year-old today will live to 92. That's 32 years in uh, retirement. So Gen Y don't want to really make commitments until 29 or 30. Baby boomers want to retire at 60 and live to 90. That's 30, 30, 30. How much tax must you pay between 30 and 60 to notionally support yourself for another 60 years of life, let alone to pay for people who don't pay tax? Whatever it is that you think you are paying at the moment must be increased. The only way this model can work is if we extend the working life, or if we moderate our expectations, or if we reduce our exposure to the health budget through wellness, well-being, early detection, all the sorts of products and technologies that are now being identified uh, by groups not unlike uh, Johnson & Johnson and, and others, of course. Um, this is the big picture perspective of where we are and where we're heading. What about the next 10 years? Literally the next 10 years. Business is very focused on the here and now. But before you look forward to 10 years, the first thing you must do is look back 10 years. In this chart, I've looked at the number of people on the Australian continent over the decade through to 2014. And we've added about 3.6 million people, 3.5 million people over 10 years. We've gone from 20 to 23.5 mil. Here's where we've fallen across the age profile very important in terms of health services delivery. We've increased the kid population under the age of four by 250,000. The baby blip, the baby bonus, Gen X, Gen Y jumping on the baby bandwagon. The kid business is a good business to have been in over the last decade. In 2000, we were producing 240,000 babies per year. It is now 310,000 babies per year. Good business to be in. And then the 20-somethings, the cafes, bars, restaurants, gap years. Um, student accommodation is a business to have been in over the last decade. These are the children of the baby boomers and here are the baby boomers, sea changing and tree changing and Rhine River cruising and superannuation investing. Has this not been the story of the last 10 years? Absolutely fascinating but completely irrelevant to the next 10 years. It's simply there to show you the connection between business and popular culture and demographic surge points. Over the next decade, we will add not 3.6 million, we will add 4.2 million. There is a prima facie case to say that building, construction, finance, uh, um, housing finance, infrastructure would be businesses to be in. Also health. Not so much in the kid population. We've lifted the birth rate from 1.7 to 1.9 births per woman. We won't lift it to 2.1 because that's the equivalent of the American birth rate and that's underpinned by the black and the Latino population. Good business to be in, but it's not going to grow in the next 10 years as it grew in the last 10 years. But all those kids now pop up in primary school and junior secondary school, suburbia, health, sports, kids medicine, sports medicine, sports health would be businesses to be in. And student accommodation, remember that student accommodation business that you got into? get the hell out of it in 2010 because it has moved on into their 30s. What do people in their 30s want in Australia? They want affordable housing. If I was advising a politician on how to be popular over the next decade, I would say own the issue of affordable housing. That is going to be a rising force over the next decade. And then of course the baby boomers. You've got these Generation Xs coming along behind. I'm very sorry to say, baby boomers, but there's not enough Generation Xs coming along behind to compete for your property. You won't get price tension. You won't get property value growth in the next 10 years that you've got in the last 10 years. But all those baby boomers now pop up in early active retirement, wellness, well-being, Ryan River Cruises, portfolio lifestyles, grandparenting, health prevention measures, hips and knees replacements, 
succession planning, financial planning. These are all businesses that are driven by these three surge points, if you like, in the demographics uh, going forward. Let's go and take another really big picture perspective, a hundred year perspective of the Australian population, 1950 through to 2005. This chart tracks the number of people added to the Australian continent every year for 55 years, showing the number of people added to the 65 plus demographic. It's the retirement population. Do we not agree that since 1950, the number of people added to the retirement bucket every year has been, let's be generous, let's call it 40,000 people per year. We have had to grow our economy by a sufficient amount to accommodate another 40,000 people per year and say, thank you very much, you'll have an age pension. Thank you very much, you'll have pharmaceutical benefits and everything else that goes with that. That's up to 2005. Here is the next 45 years. And of course, the impact here is on pensions, but it's also an impact specifically in the health sector. And it's why business is positioning itself. And it's why we actually need to reduce our exposure to the health costs. How would you do that? Preventative medicine, preventative technology, anything, wellness, well-being, everything you can do to invest in that demographic, 55 to 65, to offset or to prevent uh, issues down the track. The other point here is that the people that were retiring here uh, came from the Great Depression that fought in the Second World War. These are people that held bizarre values. They valued concepts like frugality, austerity, going without, don't worry about me, I'll be fine. The people coming into retirement here come from a different generation. They're baby boomers. It's all about me, my life, my problems. Uh, and in fact, um, uh, in fact, if you're not in there getting everything you're entitled to and more, then you're a loser. We need to actually shift the, uh, the mindset. And in fact, um, uh, if you think of the, uh, the health expectations, not just of the volume of people coming into that time in life cycle, uh, but, their, um, but, their, but, but their expectations. I'm not feeling well. I want a blood test, I want a CAT scan, I want an MRI scan, I want to all provided just down the road because I've paid tax all my working life. The fact that you've paid tax all your working life uh, may, be, may be true, but uh, can we afford the number of people with the level of expectation in health and wellness going forward? What can we do as a society to moderate or to prevent or to deflect or to reduce the liability that might lie down the track of a vast segment of the population moving into their 70s and 80s in that frail age stage in the life cycle. We need to be investing now as a community in ways to actually mitigate that risk going forward. And health prevention programs, wellness, wellbeing programs uh, and medical technology will help us get there. Thank you very much.